until later in 1917, reports of his speeches in the United States had appeared in the Calcutta Journal Modern Review. And in April 1917, the nationalist leader, C.R. Das, questioned and challenged the recently published opinion of the poet, who had been the high priest of the nation idea at the inception of the Swadeshi movement. The whole of this anti-nation idea appeared to Das to be insubstantial, based upon a vague and nebulous concept of universal humanity. He refused to accept the idea of nationalism being a foreign importation. The spirit of nationalism, he contended, was founded upon a permanent and immutable relation which subsists between a particular people and the land which they inhabit. He conceded that the First World War was the consequence of nationalism pushed to its excess. Yet the larger union among the peoples of Europe in the future would also be founded on the principle of nationalism. <coughs> and if, at some dim and distant day, the Federation of Humanity is established in this world, he continued, that will be because the different nations of this earth will each have reached the full development of its distinctive peculiarities. Distinctiveness, he asserted, can never be abolished. However, he could see union bringing out in sharp relief the deeper harmony which underlies all outer differences between different nationalities. That was the ground on which the universal brotherhood of man could be forged and that the East and the West could be said to have met and not in vain. So even someone who was questioning Tagore's critique of nationalism wanted to keep in play some idea of universal humanity. Now, if Swadeshi nationalism had forged connections with Asian universalism, the non-cooperation and Khilafat movement led by Mahatma Gandhi in the aftermath of World War I was inextricably linked with the evocation of an Islamic universalism. Let Hindus not be frightened by pan-Islamism, Gandhi had written in his journal, Young India. It is not, it need not be, anti-Indian or anti-Hindu. In exhorting Hindus to extend support to Muslims on the Khilafat question, Gandhi saw no contradiction between a territorial conception of nationalism and an extraterritorial anti-colonial sentiment. The movement that united Hindus and Muslims was led in Bengal by none other than C.R. Das, who tried to preserve the spirit of unity even after Gandhi called off the non-cooperation movement. As he put it, nationalism is merely a process in self-realization, self-development, and self-fulfillment. It is not an end in itself. The growth and development of nationalism is necessary so that humanity may realize itself, develop itself, and fulfill itself. With the waning of the Khilafat movement and the abolition of the institution by Kamal Ataturk in 1924, Indian nationalists turned again towards the dream of an Asian universalism. In 1924, Tagore traveled once more by sea to Burma, China, and Japan. The poet's entourage on his travels typically included a small but formidable team of intellectuals and artists. He always took along other artists and scholars with him on every voyage that he took in 1916, 1924, 1927, 1932, to different parts of Asia. He had very important companions. Now, on the 1924 journey to East Asia, Tagore's two companions were the painter, Nandolal Bose, and Kiti Mohan Sen, an erudite scholar of Sanskrit and comparative religion, uh, who happens to be uh, the grandfather of Amartya Sen, who is a Harvard University professor, uh, and um, uh, who himself is a Nobel Prize winning economist, of course, uh, but uh, he is also quite a skilled Sanskritist, having learned Sanskrit from his grandfather. Now, on this trip to East Asia, Tagore preached the virtues of close interaction among Asian cultures. Stung by the passage of the Immigration Act of 1924, sometimes referred to as the Orientals Exclusion Act in the United States, some of Tagore's admirers even established an Asiatic Association in Shanghai to foster solidarity among all Asians. As the group traveled, 
Nandulal Bose, the painter, was somewhat disappointed to see that <coughs> painting and the other higher arts in China had, as he put it, become infected by the Western virus. But he also noticed marvelous paintings and collected beautiful old rubbings and picked up prints, postcards, and books <coughs> with life stories of Chinese painters. He himself did a number of sketches as picture postcards and documented the trip in photographs. In Japan, the painter had the privilege of being hosted by Tagore's friend, the artist who had visited India, Yokoyama Taika, and he was introduced to the masterpieces of Japanese art. And this is a sketch that he made of the great Japanese master. Tagore's visit to the Malaya Peninsula in 1927 gave him a chance to have a conversation with the Chinese literati. The Chinese had named the Indian poet Chu Chen Tang, Thunder and Sunlight of India, based on the following equations. Robi equals Tan equals morning sun, Indra equals Chen equals Thunder, India equals Tian Shu, heavenly kingdom. Among the Malay Chinese Tagore met was the barrister Song Ong Siang, who had authored a book titled 100 <coughs> Years History of the Chinese in Singapore, 1819 to 1919, and this had been published in 1923. Another was Dr. Lin Bun Keng, who along with Song had run the Straits Chinese magazine from 1897 to 1907. In 1911, Lin had gone to Europe to take part in the Universal Racers Congress in London. He was by now the head of Amoy University, but as a product of the famous Raffles School, retained close ties with the city founded by Raffles. Lin Bun Keng had recently completed an English translation of the Li Xiao, an elegy on encountering sorrows by the 4th century BC Chinese poet Chu Yuan. Tagore was much enchanted by the life, work, and death of Chu, who had in the end drowned himself in the Milo River in Hunan. Once Lin sent him a copy of his manuscript, Tagore wrote a foreword for this book while he was in Penang. A trip to the Malay Peninsula was unthinkable without including a visit to Malacca. From Malacca, the sea presented a serene spectacle. The ocean beach was spread out in front of the poet in the shape of a half moon. The color of the shallow waters made the sea look as if it was clad in the earth's saffron end of a sari. On the left were coconut trees leaning on one another for support. A group of Punjabi Hindu, Muslim, and Sikh men came to pay their homage to the poet in Malacca. According to the Muslim, Tagore was not only a poet of the highest caliber, but by the grace of Qudat Allah, had also attained the sawbuf, or enlightenment of a Sufi mystic. But the idyll was soon to be rudely disturbed. Subhaya Naidu came to Malacca to tell Tagore about the dismal condition of Indian laborers on the rubber plantations, of whom the great majority were Tamils from southern India. Some of the British rubber barons seemed unhappy with the Indian poet's progress through the Malay Peninsula. And on the 2nd of August, 1927, the Malay Tribune published an editorial on Dr. Tagore's politics, which was a blistering attack on the poet for something he had purportedly written in the Shanghai Times. Tagore was quoted as having said, Asia prepare her weapons in her armories for a target which is bound to be the heart of Europe. The poet had actually written or said nothing of that kind to the Chinese paper. When he had visited China in 1924, he had been greatly disturbed to see the brutal use of Sikh armed police against the Chinese in Shanghai, and had written a Bengali article protesting against the British practice of using Indian troops overseas. An English translation of the article was published in the Modern Review in early 1927, which then got recycled in garbled form in the Shanghai Times and the Malay Tribune. An energetic young Tamil scholar in Malaya noticed the distortions, and the Indian paper, Malayan Daily Express, published a strong rejoinder under the title, anti tagore Bubble Print, an object lesson in dishonest journalism. <laughs> Going back to the painter who often traveled with Tagore and, he were, and who lived in Shantiniketan, the university town that Tagore had set up, Nandalal Bose, while he was still respectful of Indian traditions, 
Under Tagore's influence in the 1920s and early 30s, he traveled quite far from the predilections of the Swadeshi decade of 1905 to 1915. His artistic evolution is best exemplified in his experiments with the Madonna motif. These images were a radical break from the Bengal school's early forms of venerating country and goddess as mother. At an exhibition in 1926-27, he displayed a small tempera panel featuring a human mother and child flanked on either side by three animal mothers with their cubs. The artistic equivalence of motherly love in the human and animal worlds was recognized by an important critic as a key innovation in the depiction of mother figures. Five years later, Nandalal brilliantly portrayed a Bengali Madonna in his painting Chaitanya Janani, or Birth of Chaitanya, celebrating the birth of the great 15th century Indian exponent of bhakti, or personal devotion to God. A certain resemblance was discernible between the facial contours of the Bengali Madonna and the mother in the 1926-27, the human mother in the 1926-27 tempera panel. Even if Nandulal had moved artistically beyond the ideals of worshipping Mother India, patriotic sentiment still moved him. The civil disobedience movement stirred him sufficiently to create Dandi March, or Bakuji, a 1930 line of art depicting Mahatma Gandhi on his salt march. However, his greatest contribution to the popular culture of mass nationalism was the several hundred Haripura posters. As many as 86 were by his own hand, and they embellished the public and private spaces of the annual session of the Indian National Congress at Haripura in Gujarat in February of 1938. Following the port style, he later wrote, we did a large number of paintings and hung them everywhere, on the main entrance, inside the volunteers' camps, even in the rooms meant for Bapuji, that is Mahatma Gandhi, and Shubhash Babu, that is Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose, the president of the Indian National Congress that year. <laughs> Shubhash Bose later visited Shantiniketan in January 1939, where he met Rabindranath Tagore as well as Nandalal Bose and his art students. <coughs> this is Shantiniketan, where uh, Chinese studies, Japanese studies, Southeast Asian studies were all nurtured in the first half of the 20th century. Developments in East Asia during the late 1930s had by this time brought a measure of disillusionment with the idea of Asia. Japan's invasion of China in 1937 had shown Asia to be as prone to nationalist wars as Europe. In its October 1937 issue, the Modern Review carried a long essay by Shubhash Chandra Bose titled Japan's Role in the Far East. In some ways, it offered a remarkably dispassionate, realist analysis of power relations in East Asia. Towards the end of the article, however, Bose did not hesitate to reveal where his sympathies lay. Japan, he conceded, had done great things for herself and for Asia. He recalled how Japan had been a beacon of inspiration for all of Asia at the dawn of the 20th century. He welcomed Japan's stance against the Western imperial powers. But, he asked, could not Japan's aims be achieved, quote, without imperialism, without dismembering the Chinese Republic, without humiliating another proud, cultured, and ancient race, unquote. No, he replied, with all our admiration for Japan, where such admiration is due, our whole heart goes out to China in her hour of trial. He then went on to draw some ethical lessons for India from the conflict in East Asia. Standing at the threshold of a new era, he wrote, let India resolve to aspire after national self-fulfillment in every direction, but not at the expense of other nations, and not through the bloody path of self-aggrandizement and imperialism. The 1940s were a turbulent decade for Bengal, India, and indeed the whole of Asia. Tagore passed away in August 1945, 